Good morning, everybody. If you're just coming in, I have two questions open right now to start lecture. One of them is about um, the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons if we were to sum them all up for an ion. So that's one of our opening questions for today. I also have this, an extra credit problem. So periodically, I'll just give uh, just a question I'm curious about hearing your guys' response on. And I'll just let you earn these points and not count the question in the total you have to earn points for. So this is a chance to earn a couple extra points uh, throughout this semester on questions like this. But I'm kind of curious today on which social media you guys like the least. Um, the front runner, I can see the results coming in here. The front runner clearly is Facebook. So <laughs> that's kind of surprising. But to be honest, I had no idea which one it would be. OK, as um, you guys get logged in to that, you, I'll leave these open. You throughout class. So uh, as a reminder, generally these opening questions will be open until we start discussing them or coming back to them throughout our discussions in class. So if you do come in late, um, if you have a few moments after another question we might work on, you might go back to looking at the opening question. Um, OK, so just a couple announcements for today. Um, I've added some pre-lecture videos. Um, well, I added those already. But I finally made them embedded. So if you go to, let's take a quick peek. OK, so um, I, we may have to talk about this a few times to make sure this makes sense. But mastering um, scores do take a few moments to update in the Carmen gradebook. So if you finish a mastering assignment and you go to the Carmen gradebook, you're going to see there's a lag in your score updating. It takes about a half hour is what it seems. And then your score finally appears as it should as your final score. So I know there's a little bit of a lag there in your score showing up. And also be aware that your maximum homework score is a 100%. So all the extra credit assignments, you're not earning extra credit to apply to other parts of the class, just to lost homework points. Um, we grade on a curve in the end of the class. So in the end of the class, we look at a, whoops, uh, we look at a curve for the class. And we're going to set the curve probably in the average range of about a C plus to a B minus. And, um, whether, no matter where that percentage is. So if I let everybody earn bonus on the homework, you're actually losing ground towards the average score if we don't cap it at 100%. So believe it or not, it's actually better for you if I cap it at 100, since we're basing our grades on the overall average in the class and not on some pre-built grade scale. Um, so, so just be aware of that. So perfect score is what you're shooting for, but also learning the content, using extra assignments as needed. Yes? Yeah, so the extra credit homeworks, there's two types. That's a good question, because I was probably going to forget to mention this. There's the daily extras that you guys probably easily see here, the extra credits that are available Monday through Fridays. There's also a set available on Sundays. If you notice, this Sunday, there's like four or five assignments that are due. Um, and I think I actually pushed the problem set because of the holiday over to Monday. So this week's normal problem set due Sunday is actually going to be due Monday. And then there's these extra credit. They're called dynamic study modules. I make those available on Sundays. Um, they weren't available last Sunday, but like select Sundays, there's like three to four of these that will be available for like two extra credit points. So if you saw the basic math skills, whatever on your calendar, that's an extra credit assignment. So your only required assignments every week are the four assignments, the two pre-lectures, and then the Wednesday night, and then the Sunday nights. And there will be some lectures where we don't have some things when holidays pop up and things like that. Like fall break, we don't have a Wednesday assignment that week. So some things like that. Lecture score. Um, if you're wondering how's your lecture score set, I can't get Top Hat to, to do the math I needed to do. I have to do this at the end of the semester. But just know that you take your total score that you earn, that, that, that Top Hat will show you, take your total number of points you earn, divide by the number of questions I've asked between last, uh, uh, this past Tuesday's lecture on forward. And then just don't count the extra credit. Like if I ask a silly question about social media, that's not counted in the total. So those are extra credit points for you guys to earn. The goal here is to have you guys try, be responsible for getting the right answer, but not like uber responsible. You know, being responsible for trying to, to, to be efficient and diligent when you work on problems here, but not ultimately like losing points in the end towards the class. So um, if you miss all the questions, you may lose some points, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so if you get most of the questions right, about 80% is what it would take if I didn't give extra credit with the extra credit stuff that we're giving, probably like. Reasonably, you need to get about 70% of the questions right in class, and you'll get a perfect 100% score at the end of the semester. So just trying to make sure we're not discouraging anybody early on from uh, problems. If you miss a problem, it's not the end of the world. You probably earn bonus. You earn a small bonus on every question you get right so that you don't have to lose your ground towards your final grade in the class. OK. Um, so what I wanted to start class today with was a problem where we just do another sig fig example. Um, to try to make sure that this sets in. Sig figs to me 
it's like three rules, right? When you add and subtract, it's all about decimal places. When you multiply and divide, it's all about counting sig figs. When you do mixed operations, it's about applying those rules in the order you do your mathematical steps. Three, so in, in the course of 30 seconds, you can state the rules, but applying them is tricky. It's something you just need a lot of examples. So let's just do one more example here today. I'll let you guys do this and I'll review it after we get your responses in. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. So when we do 2.5, times 0.295. It's like this is the calculation we're probably doing first here in this step of significant figure operations. We're going to do that multiplication first. We have two sig figs times three. So the result of the product of these two numbers would be equal to 0.7375, but only to two significant figures. Because we had two sig figs times three, that digit's only good to two significant figures. Now. Sometimes you look at this problem, you might say, well, there's a multiplication step, there's two sig figs and one, so the answer should have two sig figs. Like, this is, it's not that simple. Like, we can't just ever look at this problem and say, okay, this has two sig figs, so it has to be two necessarily. It's usually not that simple in these sig fig problems. The result of that multiplication step has two sig figs, but then the other number has five, ending in the thousands place, hundreds place here. We're gonna have to round our result to that greater quantity placeholder, that greater quantity decimal place, just the greater quantity hundreds place versus the thousands place. Um, occasionally we see problems with scientific notation. If we have two different scientific exponents on numbers, we need to compare with the same exponent or compare to the same type of decimal place. So we need to be cautious that we compare real numbers with each other where we can actually look and compare their actual decimal places where the numbers truly end. Okay, and so that's going to lead this result. We do the subtraction. It's going to be 12.267 minus 0.7375. Now, I don't necessarily round. This isn't a huge detail, but usually you can keep these digits around and then just round the problem only once at the very end. It doesn't change a whole lot on like a two-step problem. Once you're in lab, imagine you're in lab, you write down calculation one, two, three, and you keep doing another calculation with a number. If you keep rounding each number every single time, by the time you get to the final answer, if you compare what that answer may have been if you never had rounded until the very final answer, you may get a drastically different number. In the end, that's how you kind of miss Mars when you're shooting a, a rocket at it. So, um, the, so rounding once at the end is usually the much better way to go. And so this is going to end up being 11.53 once we do our, or, um, it's 5295 once we round to the proper placeholder, 11.53. So four significant figures on this particular question here. Okay, so, um, so just know it's not as simple as just looking at the sig figs and counting them, the least number in a problem. We have to apply the multiplication rule um, and then the subtraction rule in the order that we're actually doing those particular steps. Okay, so let's get into chapter two. So chapter two finally gets into a discussion of what I would call chemistry. You know, we've been dealing mostly with um, some terminology in the first half of chapter one and we were dealing with some mathematical stuff in the second half of chapter one. So we're gonna finally start talking about atoms, molecules, and ions. Chapter three, we'll get into chemical reactions. Um, so we'll start getting into some actual chemistry problems here very soon. And so um, the chapter two, kind of a quick summary, is we talk about development of some of the um, theories of the atom. Um, we talk about at atomic molecular and formula weights, so we can figure out how much different types of molecules um, have in terms of their mass. Um, we're gonna work with the atomic mass unit and talk about that within this chapter. Next chapter, we're gonna get into like ordinary gram units and start talking about the mole and those types of problems. Um, we're gonna talk about the periodic table um, briefly in this chapter, molecular versus ionic compounds, kind of two fundamentally different types of compounds. It's really important that we kind of see them like a water molecule as being fundamentally different than like NaCl. Just the way NaCl behaves, you have plus and minus charges on sodium chloride as an ionic compound, gives it a much different set of properties than a molecule that has atoms without those types of charges built into them like ionic compounds. And then towards the very end, we're gonna really just try to learn about some different types of compounds through naming them. Um, so we're gonna try to learn some systematic nomenclature um, next time. We're gonna go through that more um, in the next lecture. Okay, so.
Um, so atomic theory, it was around the early 1800s that Dalton began to kind of think of there being atoms um, comprising matter. Um, so if you're trying to think of like when was it that the atom kind of came into an idea of s uh, explaining um, what matter um, is, it's the early 1800s. And so without much evidence per se, this is just mostly just from, from some thought examples that Dalton was applying. And so the idea that Dalton had was that, okay, there are different elements. They were starting to realize that like iron is different from you know, things like um, oxygen and carbon at this point but not entirely sure exactly what it was that made those atoms different from each other. If you start thinking about protons and neutrons and things that we know today, that wasn't until um, sort of the early 1900s that th those sort of terms and ideas came to be discovered um, definitively through some fundamental physics experiments that we'll talk about. So the idea that Dalton had is that elements are comprised of small particles called atoms, that atoms of the same element are mostly identical to each other. I mean, he said they were identical, we now probably know that like say carbon can be carbon 12 or carbon 13. So even within a particular element, we probably know there's isotopes of elements. So that's not entirely true, but this is just a postulate before anything was even known about what an isotope even is in the first place. Um, elements cannot interconvert to each other by chemical means. Like this was something in the early 1800s they discovered that you couldn't just take iron and turn it into carbon. You know, so like an element was an element mostly permanently. Now, we can, we can know today, or you may know from physics, or maybe you've seen um, some nuclear chemistry, just in terms of different types of nuclear reactions that take place, like uranium can decay into like a thorium atom uh, by a, a process of its normal radioactive decay. But that's a slow process on the grand scheme of things. You know, it's not something you can just easily go into the lab and mix together um, uranium with, with some type of compound and get out thorium. You know, so it's, it's slow uh, processes of chemical reactions can change elements from one type to another, but not like a specific reaction you can intentionally do in the lab very easily. Um, you can also inject neutrons and protons into atoms, do all kinds of fancy nuclear physics types uh, of experiments to make different sorts of radioactive elements. This is how they might make like a cobalt atom that's used in the, the, the treatment of some cancers. Uh, but that's, again, not something you're going in the lab and mixing chemicals together to lead to the formation of those new types uh, or different types of elements. So simple chemical reactions are never going to lead one element to a different type of element. So carbon's effectively always carbon, uh, nitrogen's always nitrogen. Um, and then compounds can certainly change places with each other, bond with each other to form compounds. And so this got into the idea of whole number ratios. So when you take carbon and oxygen, maybe carbon and oxygen in one way will mix together um, to make CO2. Um, and it's a, a very whole number, precise count of two oxygen atoms for every one carbon, or one O2 molecule for every one carbon go together to make one particular CO2 molecule. So that molecules began to be thought of as having a simple whole number ratio of the elements that, um, that made them up. And so this led to a couple other ideas like law of conservation of mass, that we can carry chemical reactions out, but we're not changing the mass. You're just interconverting the types of bonds in your reactants to those in your products, keeping the atoms the same. So we're not creating and destroying matter in reactions. We're just changing the form of the bonds within the atoms in the matter. And then um, the law of multiple proportions is just telling us that compounds themselves have these like multiple proportions of like one C to two O's within the formula, that you get a specific whole number ratio within a molecule of those atoms. So that would be the law of multiple proportions. Now there's some fundamental discoveries. This is kind of a summary. We'll go through in the next couple slides some more uh, pictures. You may have read about these already. So the, the quick summary would be, you know, J.J. Thompson, cathode ray tube experiment, kind of like an old cathode ray TV. Um, like the old big style TVs you might remember when you were young kids, that those are basically electrons hitting a screen, causing the screen to change a color um, if that electron's turned on or off, so you get your different colors on your TV screen. And so this was um, late 1800s that it was discovered that the cathode rays were actually electrons. So this was the sort of beginning of the discovery of the subatomic nature of matter. Until this point, people, you probably had heard the atom is the most divisible form of matter. Um, probably easier to be the most stable form of matter. Um, you, can, you, can, you can get electrons, and, and of course you'd probably now know protons and neutrons um, are um, the subatomic particles within matter, but you're not gonna easily rip those apart. It's gonna take a fair bit of effort. 
So the electron was discovered in the cathode ray tube experiment. That was the discovery, also the subatomic nature of matter. So that was when we started to realize atoms actually had particles within them. Uh, Millikan's oil drop experiment in 1909 um, was able to determine the charge and the mass of the electron. Um, and so then some radioactivity experiments were then able to determine some different type of rays that are given off by radioactive elements, kind of pointing towards the nature of electrons, there being a positive charge counterpart within the atom that we now know as the proton. Uh, the neutron, interestingly, is not discussed on how it was discovered. Um, it, the neutron was not discovered until about 1929 um, in terms of a subatomic particle. Um, and so the, um, um, and gamma rays were discovered here as like a high energy packet of energy. So this is mostly just a, a, a packet of light, a very high energy being given off by radioactive elements. Um, and Rutherford uh, came up with a very fascinating discovery of shooting particles at gold foil and found that some of the particles were scattered. And from the scattering was able to then determine that it was because atoms contain nuclei. The nuclei then was found or uh, was supported to contain a majority of the mass of the atom. So that's where our protons and the neutrons are going to be found within the atom. The most massive particles, the electron is going to be the very light particle that's um, sort of in orbits, if you will, or spinning around that nucleus. And so then um, the proton formally discovered 1919 and um, the neutron, uh, I said 29 earlier, I guess I meant 1932. So um, later in the 30s, um, the discovery, the 1930s, the discovery of the neutron. We can take a closer look at some of these experiments and get a sense that we had a material that was being uh, subject to a high voltage of electricity to cause the electron to fall off the atom, and then the electron would have a negative charge, um, so the negative particle would be attracted downward towards the positive direction of the electric field. So that's how they're able to find the, the sort of opposite charge of the electron compared to the positive direction of the electric field. So you could bend the flight of that electron using a magnetic or an electric field consistent with a negatively charged particle. So then the, the Millikan oil drop experiment, so you took an oil um, and sort of had a, a sprayer to spray the oil into a vacuum system, and then you could imagine dropping like little droplets of oil and then shooting um, like an x-ray at the oil droplets. Now the x-ray has a lot of energy. The energy can kick electrons off um, or form electrons on the droplet, and then what they started to find is that you got a multiple of like one or two or three or four electrons on the droplets. You may end up with a whole number multiple of electrons. And then by just using gravity, so they could use gravity, apply a field. So you have this negative particle, apply um, a, a negative potential, the negative electron repels the field and then can be held neutral within the field. They could observe where the droplet was, how fast it was raising up towards a positive direction. Um, it would take a lot of physics to understand how they were able to work this out, but this is how they worked out the charge of the electron. And, and they did that by noticing that they had droplets with multiples of charge that all centered around a particular whole number. And that whole number was about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And they, um, they determined the number to be like 1.59 times 10 to the minus 19 back in like 1909 or whenever this experiment was done, uh, maybe 1900. And then later, when you refine the experiment, it ended up being like 1.602. I mean, they were almost dead on with their technology in the early 1900s with exactly calculating the specific charge on one electron. And then from this experiment, they also got the, the mass of the electron. And the, the, the key thing here was that the electron was very, very light compared to the atom. So there wasn't much mass involved in the electron. Um, so most of the mass must reside on that positive charge. Later, what became and on the neutron. So Marie Curie, two Nobel Prizes um, uh, for her work on studying radioactive material, took radioactive substance um, and then was able to find three different particles. And so the key was that the one particle, the beta ray, looked just like that electron. It went up towards the positive direction of the electric field, just like the particle in um, the cathode ray tube experiment. So this is just a beam of electrons was coming off of this radioactive material. And then there was an alpha ray that was going downward, but not by as much. And so you have a light electron going up very high towards the, the um, electric field, but the alpha particle just barely going downwards. So the alpha ray just carried a lot more mass. It was a much more massive particle than the electron. 
It turns out, you know, this is an interesting thing. I was trying to figure out well, what point did they realize this? Uh, because like now we know this is a helium nuclei. Um, that that's what the alpha ray is. It's a beam of helium atoms or, or, or helium ions. It's just like the nucleus of a helium atom. And the reason why that that's coming off a radioactive element, this is discussed later in like chapter 21. But the reason why this comes off is because that turns out to be one of the most stable nuclei. So a really stable nuclei falls off an unstable nuclei, and then they could see that being given off here. So like when did they know? They just knew at that point it was like a positively charged, massive particle. So that's how they're getting the mass ratio to be higher for the proton compared to the electron, then eventually figuring out that, oh, there's actually two protons and two neutrons within this nuclei, and then that's descriptive of what a helium nucleus is. And so at some point they discovered you know, the proton, the neutron, the different um, nuclei and established that that was just the helium nucleus. The gamma ray, this is just energy. You might call this H nu. That's just a way of saying light. It's just a packet of energy. So another particle being given off by radioactive material is just a high energy packet of energy. Okay, so Rutherford's discovery was kind of, um, you know, it's easy to take this for granted today because we all know, I think, that the atom has a nucleus. That's where the protons and neutrons are. And that was discovered almost, um, this is one of those experiments that they screwed it up, they would have eventually figured this out, I believe. But um, what, what the researchers did was they took the, um, the alpha particles from the previous experiment that we were talking about. So they took the helium nuclei at the point where they just knew it was a massive, positively charged particle, and they shot that at a thin strip of gold. And so what they thought was at the time is that this was the model of the atom. So they thought this is called the plum pudding model. Just meaning that imagine all of your positive charge, you have discrete positive particles, discrete negative particles, and that they're all intermixed together. Now at the time, I, I really wish I could get the head of a physicist at the time to think, what, how could you have a, a, a relatively heavy and slow moving massive particle, all about all these electrons that are gonna have to have a much higher velocity relative to those slow, heavier protons or positive charge. How can they intermix together? You know, it just seems kind of strange. It'll, it'll be almost like us standing still while all these kids are bouncing off of us in a room. It just doesn't seem to make sense. Like we would probably all get together and have the kids running around the outside of us so they don't bump into us as much. It seems like a much better idea. Uh, but, but the idea at the time, J.J. Thompson is the one uh, from the cathode ray tube experiment proposed this model. And the idea would be if you shoot a particle through this atom, it should just go right through it. You know, because there's really nothing in the way. You have all this like tiny mass in a tiny little particle in a, in a small region of the atom. So there's probably really nothing in the atom to cause a deflection of the light. Now, the scientist who actually did the experiment wasn't Ernest Rutherford, it was a couple other people. And they didn't actually look at wide angles to see if the light was be if the particle was being deflected. They only looked right here. And originally they were like, oh, it just passes right through, consistent with this model. So they're like, okay, it checks out, perfect. But Rutherford said, hey, did you check over here to see if you have any wide range scattering particles? Um, and they didn't check, so they went back and checked, and they were, they were surprised when they did. Because what it's gonna take in order to make that happen is have a much more massive center of charge or of mass, i.e. the nucleus. It's gonna take a big nucleus to have one of those alpha particles hit it and then deflect backwards or deflect sideways. And so when they saw this wide scattering data, they then put forth a lot of um, a proof for this, but that, that it had to be coming from a large center of charge now known as the nucleus. So what these, this experiment here went to show was that we have the, the nuclear model for our atom. Now I like this quote um, here, it was uh, this coming from Ernest Rutherford. It was quite the most incredible event that had ever happened to me in my life. Um, it was almost as incredible as if you had fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back at you. So that, I mean like that's kind of what they're thinking here. You're taking a super fast, high energy particle, shooting at basically what's a transparent piece of metal, and it's deflecting backwards. And it's because of the, the nuclei. Um, so really important discovery, but it's because we already know what the atom is. You know? So we're kind of just going into a few of the experiments that go to show us some things that we already know. Like the proton and the neutron, their relative masses are almost the same, they're just a slight bit different. Um, so the mass of the proton's about one atomic mass unit, um, the neutron's about the same and the electron much lighter. So a much lighter electron, much more massive proton than the neutron. These are gonna to get together in the nucleus. The proton carries the positive charge, the neutron 
like it suggests, is the neutral charge. The charge of the proton and the electron are opposite of each other, but the same magnitude. So you're talking plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs for the proton, minus that for the electron. And so, um, and then the protons end up defining the element. So the proton count, the positive number of particles in the nucleus, that's going to tell us the properties of the atom. So the atom itself is going to be defined by the proton count. So this is going to define our atom and really tell us about our atom. So the simplest atom in terms of proton count, of course, is hydrogen, one proton in its nucleus, helium next, two protons in its nucleus. So the atomic number for an atom is just simply equal to the number of protons within the nucleus of that atom. Uh, now you can imagine this idea. You have uh, a nucleus, small. You have the electrons like circling, spinning around, doing something around that nucleus. The electrons we can change. The electrons are the outer sphere of the atom. It's going to be easy to pick off an electron, add an electron to an atom. Um, it's going to be hard to change a proton count. The proton count, we've got to get through all those electrons. Through later what we'll see are core electrons. The proton count's not changing um, by any ordinary chemical means. So we're not just going to add a proton or take a proton away to create ions. We're going to create ions by changing the number of electrons. OK, so the um, electrons, protons, um, have identical but opposite charges. And then our symbols, we can give symbols like helium, and then the mass number, and then the atomic number. The atomic number is what defines the atom. That's just the number of protons. And then I like this number here, having the word mass number, or the term the mass number, because it's the number of particles that actually carry the mass, or majority of the mass, in the atom. That's the protons and the neutrons. So for helium, mass number of four, um, it's the second element. If you need to know the atomic number, it's just the element order on the periodic table. So helium two, so it has two protons and then hence two neutrons. Okay, we'll get into charge here in a moment. So let's look at this question here. So for copper, 64. Now there's two ways to give the mass number. Let me mention this nomenclature system before we get too far into solving this particular problem. The number after the dash is the mass number, not the atomic number. So the atomic number is given by the element type. So the atomic number goes hand in hand with the atom. And then the mass number goes hand in hand with the sum of the protons added together with the number of neutrons. And then for an atom to be neutral and charged, instead of thinking of the relative charge, an atom should have an equal number of protons and electrons to have an overall neutral charge. Okay, so figure out how many neutrons copper 64 has. Okay, so this one here, pretty easy question. The key here, though, was knowing where to get the atomic number for copper. So we get the atomic number for copper from the periodic table to 29th element. So copper has 29 protons in its nucleus. So take the difference here between the total. Gives us a number of neutrons. So that should be what, 35? Yeah, 35. So the... Um, uh, again, the, the, the idea of the proton and the neutron compare the majority of the mass, the electron a small amount of mass. So that's what we're going to change is the electron count to make cations and anions. So let's take a couple examples here. Maybe look at sodium. So if we were to look at sodium, um, the number of protons for sodium would be 11. And for some atoms, we may not necessarily care so much about the neutron count um, because the, the, what really defines properties of atoms is that positive charge to negative charge kind of balance that they have. We get into that a lot more in chapter seven. But um, for sodium, um, if we just have elemental sodium from the periodic table, it would have 11 electrons to give it that neutral charge. We could take one away. If we have sodium with a positive charge, we have a net plus charge. How are we going to get there? Do we lose an electron, gain an electron, lose a proton, gain a proton? So you may start thinking, OK, we could gain a proton, but we can't gain protons. We fundamentally aren't gaining and changing proton counts. So it's this electron count here. So if we have 11 protons now, but 10 electrons, we now have one extra positive charge, then negative charged particles. 
therefore the atom bears that net positive charge. So a positive charged um, ion is called a cation. Um, that's an example where we've lost an electron off of the neutral counterpart of the atom. If we compare that with something like chlorine, so chlorine um, from the periodic table, 17th element, so 17 protons. So elemental chlorine would have 17 electrons. Uh, we could make a negative ion uh, where we gain an electron and have 18 electrons. So 17 for the normal count, and then plus one electron to give it the overall minus charge. That would be the anion of chlorine. Now, you could imagine like sodium had an electron perhaps at some point, it gave it to chlorine, uh, because that makes both of them more stable once they then pair up together and make a compound together. So sodium chloride kind of results from sodium having lost an electron to make sodium plus, chlorine having gained that electron to go to Cl minus, so we end up with sodium plus Cl minus as what we now know or call an ionic compound, a compound simply comprised of ions. Now, the one group of elements, kind of like looking at the periodic table, the noble gases, interestingly, were the last group of elements to be discovered. Um, but they, they're certainly really important because those are the stable elements as just a single gas particle. Um, so they have the stable electron count. So if you look at helium, helium has two electrons. If you look at neon, it has 10 electrons. If you look at argon, it has 18 electrons. If that's like filling a shell. We get into that in chapter six, but you probably have already seen this. But the idea is you fill an electron shell, that creates the most stable electron count. So we can fill the electron shell for other atoms like chlorine by adding to the electron count, coming up with what looks like a noble gas count. Notice how argon has 18 electrons or how neon has 10 electrons. So we're creating the cation because sodium loses the electron to come up with that noble gas count of electrons at especially stable configuration or gaining an electron because you're really close to the noble gas. So you pick up an extra electron to come up with that noble gas count. So we see that a lot in different types of ions. In particular, those that are closest to the left side go to the positive side. Those that are closest to the right side go to the minus in terms of forming cations and anions. Now, elements in the middle kind of don't do, don't do that. Those are going to be our molecular compounds. So things like C and H and O, when they bond together, they're not going to have as, a, as strong of an ability to make a, a big positively charged cation or these negatively charged ions. So they're going to exchange their electrons form covalent bonds with each other, and then form a different type of compound. And we'll classify those in this chapter as molecular compounds. So we're going to see slightly different in terms of water, where it forms a sharing of electrons through bonds, not through a plus and a two minus type ions, but through the sharing of electrons through covalent bonds. So we see that a lot throughout this class. We get into like covalent bonding, chapters eight and nine. So a lot of this stuff gets built upon so even if you don't understand what I mean when I start drawing structures, you don't have to be able to draw Lewis structures at this point in the class. Yes? So for um, sodium, is it the same number of electrons you usually think that it has 11, like each of the No, no, no. So I guess what I, so you could have two types of atoms that you could possibly encounter. So one of them might be sodium, one might be sodium plus. So sodium with like the zero charge, so with the zero charge here implied, since we don't give a charge, then this would mean it has 11 electrons. And then with the plus charge, that would mean that it has the net positive charge, so now it, this one would have, um, ah, screw that up, it would be 10 electrons. So sodium plus, 10 electrons. Sodium, no charge indicated, implied to be a zero charge, 11 electrons. Um, you can make a formula. I don't like thinking of formulas here because like you memorize it, then you forget it. It's just positive charge. If you have more positive particles than negative particles, you have a net positive charge. So if you start losing the negative particle, you have more positive. So I'm kind of looking at, at this as um, 11 protons, um, 11 electrons, and then sodium, still 11 protons, but 10 electrons. So a net positive charge. Chlorine, the opposite, has one more negative particle than net negative charge. As I'm sure you can expect, an example. Look at lead two plus. Uh, lead is element number, I'll just point in case you forget where it is, element number 82. So try to think about the proton and electron count for lead two plus. Okay, so this is a pretty easy one. 
Um, so the key here, lead 82, so we get the atomic number from the periodic table, PT's periodic table. Um, and then we have to lose two electrons off of what its count would have been if it were lead zero. So lead zero would have 82 electrons. So we're gonna have 82 electrons and then minus these two to create that positive charge for 80 electrons. So you have to kind of think if it were neutral to have a zero charge, 82 electrons, two fewer, 80 electrons. So 82 protons, 80 electrons. I keep forgetting to do this. Um, is anybody going by text message answering questions. Um, I need to fix these codes every time because I copy and paste these in. So um, has yours not been going through? Okay. If, if you ever text, if I forget to write these, just like, I don't know, throw something at me <laughs> and I'll update these numbers. So if you put, put this code in, the text will go through. It's easier if I'm in within one app and not changing apps on this thing. So it's, I don't know. And also if I include it in the notes, then you can easily write on your notes and I don't have to change apps for your writing and things like that too. Okay. Must have just had an extra slide. So I guess. Must have forgot to delete a blank slide I added. I don't think I was supposed to do something on that one. <laughs> okay. So let's summarize our modern theory of our atom and start thinking about size. Um, so we have a relatively small nucleus. Like you're talking 10 to the minus 4 angstrom compared to about 1 to 5 angstrom for the diameter of the entire atom. So if you look at the electrons, they're the ones taking up the most space even though they carry very little mass. This is really because they have a large high um, velocity, they have a big charge, they're repelling other atoms, so they're keeping one atom from getting close to another atom due to um, all of the repulsions they're gonna have with the electrons and other atoms. So if you imagine um, a helium atom and a helium atom trying to get close together, they're gonna repel each other. The electrons are going to be what prevent the atoms from getting close together. So it's the electrons that give the atom the size, um, for the space that they take up, and the nucleus is very, very small. Okay, now the angstrom scale, may, maybe you've never used this, but one angstrom is really small. One angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. Um, so it's a really small measure of length. And then um, one meter can then be said to be 10 to the plus 10 angstrom. And like for most conversions, you can write the conversion both ways. So one angstrom, 10 to the minus 10 meters. A meter would contain a lot of angstrom, 10 to the 10 meters. Okay, so I just wanted to do an example um, just to demonstrate the size of the atom, just to get a sense of how small this happens to be. And so carbon has a diameter of about 1.54 angstrom. So how many carbon atoms could we manage to align if we were to go side by side? And pencils are, we talked earlier, they're just graphite. So if you make a pencil stroke, so if we imagine having a pencil stroke of about two uh, millimeters in width, I think that's about the width you'd have with a normal um, pencil. So if you just use an ordinary pencil, I think you're gonna get a pencil stroke that's about 2.0 millimeters wide. So how many carbon atoms could we align across this little tiny distance here? And so the idea would be if the atom's small, maybe you could get five. If the atom's even smaller, maybe you can get 10 side by side. So we'll just get a glimpse at how many, how many atoms are we getting side by side across that little tiny length of the um, pencil stroke. So if one atom has a diameter of 1.54 angstrom, and we're just putting them side by side, so, so how many can we do? So we might try to use dimensional analysis here. We're trying to solve for the number of carbon atoms. So I mentioned before, we like to use dimensional analysis to solve problems when we can. And so we might start with that 2.0 millimeter wide distance, um, distance that we're using to try to see how many atoms go across that distance. Now I have a mismatch of units. I have one in millimeters, one in angstrom. Um, so I might try to convert to a common unit. So I might go 1,000 millimeters for one meter, just to convert that distance into meters. And then um, what I might use is the, um, if that was the distance, what, what if I use a diameter per carbon atom? What if I use the 1.54 angstrom per carbon atom? 
Well, but that's an angstrom. Why don't I convert this length in meters into angstrom? Why don't I say, okay, one meter is 10 to the 10 angstrom. So if I were to stop and calculate here, I'd see that across that little tiny pencil stroke, there's a whole lot of angstrom. Like the number of angstrom um, to represent 2.0 millimeters would be a pretty large number. But what that allows me to do is use the diameter of the carbon atom as a conversion. I just use 1.54 angstrom now is the diameter of one C atom. And so if carbon had a diameter of, say, 0.1 millimeter, if, if the diameter of carbon is 0.1 millimeter in a different example, let, let's just say 0.1 millimeter is the diameter of C atom. Just to make sure we're seeing the way this problem solving works. Because that would just be 2.0 millimeters times one, um, um, 0 0.1 millimeter per C atom. So you get 20 across. Okay, we're just doing that same problem, but just with the actual length being the actual width of the carbon atom, 1.54 angstrom. So you guys can throw that into a calculator. Um, this isn't like a top hat question, but if you want to calculate it with me, or you can do so. So I throw this into a calculator. I got one, uh, like 12 million, 987,000 um, and 13 sea atoms. Now, how many sig figs? Two. two, good. So two sig figs here. Everything else is infinite, infinite. And then the final conversion here is, has three sig figs, but that's gonna lead me to keeping the two. So 13 million atoms. So 13 million. We could go scientific notation. This isn't, we need to get off sig figs at some point with every single problem. But, uh, but the whole idea here, 13 million atoms across a 2.0 millimeter pencil stroke or how many carbon atoms we can align. That shows us, I think, how small the, the atom is. The atom's really small, no surprise. Um, and so, uh, so the atom's really small. The angstrom scale looks like a big number. You say 1.54 angstrom, it's a nice whole number, but it's really representing a really small length of... of um... Okay, now, in terms of, we mentioned the word isotopes earlier, how might you figure out, for a given element, what isotopes um, naturally exist within a sample of that element, and then maybe what their abundances are? So you can start to work out maybe what is, say, something like an average atomic weight. So if we were to look at something like a, a mass spectrometer, what a mass spectrometer would do is it would put a charge on the ions and it would bend those charges using a magnetic field. And through physics, through understanding the magnitude of the magnetic field and where you're seeing signal, which is hard for us to imagine how the instrument works, but just somehow is able to take the charges on these atoms, use a magnetic field, they have a slightly different mass, so they bend at different rates, you can count and separate the um, the isotopes very easily. So if you do this with chlorine, you see two isotopes emerge. So chlorine um, exists as two uh, stable isotopes naturally um, on Earth. So we get chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. The ratio is about three to one, um, is what it turns out for chlorine. Now every element's going to have its own signature. Some elements are all one isotope. Iodine happens to be just mostly one isotope. Carbon's mostly one a tiny bit of a second. Um, some elements have like three or four common isotopes that exist naturally within a sample of that particular element. So it all kind of depends on the particular element and um, um, really some nuclear physics is really what boils down to why these particular isotopes predominate. It just has, without understanding what it is that makes these nuclei especially stable, it's just something in terms of that ratio of protons and neutrons make those nuclei more stable than some other count. Um, likewise, if you, this is an interesting thought, like the largest natural occurring element on Earth is uranium. Like all the others, if you notice the periodic table kind of changes font, color, 
beyond uranium, that's to kind of suggest that um, Earth is old enough such that all those elements that at one point had existed have now decayed into the smaller elements. So there's all these like radioactive pathways that are taking some elements into others on a very slow time scale relative to our lifetimes that are giving the ratios of the elements that we see in ordinary samples. Okay, so if we wanted to work out, one of the things we might want to work out is like, what's an average atomic weight for an element? We, we might want to say, if you encounter a chlorine atom on average, what would you expect its mass to be? Like, a chlorine atom would truly have either this mass or that mass, but you may really want to start worrying about, well, what's the average mass? Because that's what we're going to put on the periodic table. We're going to put the average atomic weight, so once we start working with like 100 grams of chlorine, we're going to want to know how much, like how many chlorine atoms should that be, or how many moles of chlorine should that be? So we're going to need to use this idea of an average value throughout um, our calculations. Okay, so before we start doing some calculations on atomic weights and seeing how we can start adding them up and averaging them out for different isotopes on an atom, let's look at one more question and kind of come back to something we were looking at earlier. So what is it that makes bromine's two common occurring isotopes different? So just think about what it is that makes isotopes different from each other and make sure we didn't forget this. Also, I forgot to hit record and lecture, so I'm sitting in my office re-recording this particular slide. So the atomic mass unit scale, um, we've seen it already. The mass of the proton and neutron are just over um, about 1 AMU each, um, and slightly different from each other. Now this mass unit scale um, is defined off of that, uh, or is based off a of definition starting with carbon. So a carbon-12 atom, one of these atoms is defined to have a mass of exactly 12 AMU. And that's an exact definition. And this is just something that we have defined as scientists to be true. And so then the actual mass of a carbon atom can be determined experimentally. Now the actual mass, the true mass in grams, is 1.993 um, times 10 to the minus 23 grams. Now what that allows us to do is to set the conversion factor for AMU to gram as just a simple um, conversion. So if 12 AMU is 1.993 times 10 to the minus 23 grams, then one AMU is just equal to that number of grams divided by 12. Now that works out to be 1.661 times 10 to the minus 23 grams. So an AMU is a very small number of grams. Now one gram, if we divide both sides by that small number, works out to be a recognizable number. One gram is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 AMU. So first, a lot of AMU in a gram, a small number of grams in one AMU, just two conversions. But our conversion has this recognizable number that you may recognize as Avogadro's number. I always symbolize that as Na, so Avogadro's number. We're gonna see in chapter three that if we define the number of particles um, of a mole of a substance to be that number of particles, so if a mole of, say, carbon is um, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 carbon atoms, then we could come up with this simple conversion and say that this carbon atom has a mass of 12 AMU or 12 grams per mole. And you can get this information, um, hopefully, or, or see how this relates to the information we see in the periodic table listed for carbon. The number listed on carbon is actually 12.01. Now what that number is, is we're gonna see that that's the average atomic weight that carbon has when we consider that it's not always carbon-12, that it's also a little bit of the time carbon-13. But we'll see that in a moment. So the way we can define average atomic weight for a given element, now this is the weight that we'll see listed on a periodic table. This weight is equal to the sum of a fraction of a given isotope of an element times the atomic weight of the isotope summed over all of the isotopes. So if we have just one isotope, iodine is such an example, then the atomic weight of the one isotope of iodine is just simply the atomic weight listed on the periodic table for iodine. Most elements are a little more complicated in that they're gonna exist as, as two or more isotopes, 
So we just have to take the fraction of one isotope times its atomic weight times the fraction of another isotope times its atomic weight and simply sum all these up to arrive at the number we see listed on the periodic table for a given element. An example we can see is for that of carbon. Um, so carbon 12, six protons, six neutrons. Carbon 13, six protons, seven neutrons. The way this problem here would work out is if we're trying to calculate the average atomic weight of carbon, we're gonna sum up taking 12 AMU times the fraction, 9893. And we're going to add to that taking the 13.0034 AMU times the fraction of the other one, 0 0.0107. Now, if we think sig figs here, this is 12 AMUs exactly. So we're gonna keep all four sig figs in our fraction. So 0 0.9893 times 12 is 11.8716, good to the seven for four significant figures. Again, this is an exact mass by definition. And so then that's why we keep four significant figures. So it's not two, it's all four. And then the second step, the 13.0034 times 0.0107, that's the fraction. That carbon is carbon 13. That's 0 0.13. Nine, one. I didn't line this up very well. Let me erase for a second. So this will be 0 0.1391. And that's good to the nine. So we got thousands place, hundreds place. Our final result is good to the greater quantity. That's the sevens placeholder here, the hundreds place. So this ends up being equal to, with rounding, 12.01 AMU. Um, if you do this a bit more refined, slightly more accurate numbers, or uh, slightly more precise numbers, if you tack on a couple extra digits on these numbers, that's where you get the 12.0107, I think is the more precise um, atomic weight for an average carbon atom. So a carbon atom on average weighs 12.01 grams. Specifically, it either weighs 12 or 13.0034 AMUs, but on average, the atomic weight you see listed on the periodic table. Can I hit a button? Okay, let's do that question. It was already opened up. Some of you may have already done it, but so bromine, um, it's 79 and 81 are its common isotopes. Atomic weights are given. From the average atomic weight of bromine using a periodic table, what statement best describes the abundance of these isotopes? I'll let you guys think about that one. So for bromine, we see one isotope has a mass of about 78.9, the other about 80.9. The average atomic weight from the periodic table is right in the middle. It's about 79.9. So it's about 50-50. It's like 50.4 versus 49.6 along those lines. So each, the abundance of each isotope is approximately 50%. And so if it were mostly bromine 79, then the average atomic weight should have been closer to the mass of bromine 79. If it were mostly bromine 81, the mass should have been closer to uh, bromine 81. Now, we can solve some problems here. This turns out to be one of the weird problems from this chapter that you'll see. There's, um, if you look at the activity three that we'll work on next week, there's a, a problem on, well, if you have two isotopes and you know like a mass and abundance of one, can you calculate the mass and the abundance of the other? But just remember, the key here is just about setting up the summation. Take the fraction of one, the atomic weight of one, plus the fraction of the other, the atomic weight of the other, and the key is that those are going to equal the average atomic weight you get off the periodic table. So that you can get this from the periodic table as some fraction of 1 plus the atomic weight of, of 1 and then plus the fraction of, say, a second times the atomic weight of a second. My point is you'll see some word problems develop with this particular idea here and a couple of problems you'll see on mastering and one on next week's recitation activity. Uh, move towards a periodic table. Um, I'm sure we all know this pretty well, but some of the key things are our noble gases here, the halogen group. The idea is the atoms share properties. The only stable gases are the noble gases. None of the other elements are just stable as a single atom. 
and the gaseous state. Um, halogens share properties like they form minus one ions. Um, the oxygen group is often called the chalcogens. They share a minus two charge in their common ions. So those are just, uh, I don't know where that comes from, the chalcogens is the oxygen group. Now, once you start getting into um, the, um, um, the metalloids, you get the metalloids in the middle, you get your nonmetals um, separated. So we have some nonmetallic elements in green here. We have metals over here. Um, so nonmetals share some properties together. Metalloids share some properties together. Metals share some properties together. But something like oxygen and like a metalloid, they don't share too many properties. So just because they're in the same group doesn't mean they share a lot of properties. So metals have a lot of properties that are similar. Nonmetals have a lot of properties that are similar. Nonmetals in the same group of the periodic table have a lot of similar properties compared to each other. So oxygen and like tellurium, not as many shared properties as say oxygen and sulfur. Um, the alkalis are the, the first group. They form plus one ions. The alkalines, the next group. And then the transition metals are the main sort of um, middle part of the periodic table. Sometimes you hear the word main group. The main group are the everything but the transition metals. So the first two columns and then the, the six over here. So our periodic table, we've seen it enough times. So that's probably just a, a quick little discussion of sharing some properties, but metals are going to share more properties with metals, nonmetals with, with nonmetals, and then elements in the same group and the same type with each other. Just a few moments today is just to kind of get into one, we'll get into next time, um, molecular versus ionic compounds. A real simple example is water versus NaCl. Um, that we have a molecular compound here, an ionic compound here, melting point, 800 degrees C, zero in the case of water. So pretty clear like difference in properties for two different types of substances. So pretty good reason why we're going to classify these as two different types of compounds. And then when we start in getting into naming common compounds, what I want us to get a sense of is we already know a lot of names. Like the hard part with naming sometimes is just trying to categorize and then name within the category. Sense of a couple things. So we start running with these next time, you'll understand and remember where these names are coming from. So like sodium chloride, you know that's NaCl. I know everybody in the room knows that's NaCl. Um, and aluminum oxide is Al2O3. Now you may not have known that's aluminum oxide, but that turns out to be aluminum oxide. Now notice that you don't see these like subscripts denoted in the name. That's going to be because we recognize charge very carefully, and we'll develop why it is we know these charges next time. But aluminum only forms a three plus cation, oxygen only a two minus, and so when they pair up, we gotta balance the charge out. Compounds, a stable compound is going to have a neutral charge. We're never going to have a stable compound in a bottle with a net positive charge. That's like a thunderstorm. It's gonna find electrons, rip them off something. So we're not gonna develop positive charge. A compound, a stable compound is going to have to have a net neutral charge or be paired up with something of the opposite charge. So sodium plus, chloride minus, pair up together. Hydrochloric acid. Do you guys know the formula of hydrochloric acid? Everyone does, that's HCl. A lot of these names you already know. Did anybody know nitric acid? HNO3. Good, HNO3. Nitrous acid turns out to be HNO2, which is different from a three. So a lot of these names, I'm not trying to get you to like learn the name and formula here. I'm just trying to like re remind ourselves that we've seen these formula, we've seen these name probably at some point. Carbon monoxide is CO, that's easy. Carbon dioxide is CO2. Those are systematic names. If you remember, if you forget the system of how do you name something like NO, all you have to do is remember CO is carbon monoxide, so NO, you don't have to know anything. You know it's nitrogen monoxide is exactly the name of carbon monoxide. Ethane is CH3CH3, that's ethane. Replace one of those hydrogens with an H, uh, 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 replace one of the hydrogens with an OH group, that's ethanol. Ethanol CH3. CH2OH, I-O. Um, and so ethanol, we probably also could write that as a few different ways. You might write that as C2H5OH as well. So there's a few different ways you might write ethanol, but the key is you may remember the formula or the idea is it's kind of like ethane, but with an OH group replacing it. Okay, so naming compounds is a lot easier if we have an idea of the different types of compounds that exist 
and then we'll come up with a way of categorizing those compounds and then naming within each of those categories. And we'll go through some more systematic ways next Tuesday. All right, guys, that's all for today. Have a great weekend. Go Buckeyes. Hi, I'm Peyton.